Today I want to talk to you about an interesting example of what you might call asymmetrical warfare, although I'm going to be pointing out that in many ways it was surprisingly symmetrical warfare in this video which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. More of them later. Now, the war was one of the Maori wars of the mid-19th century, and Sir Duncan Cameron had been sent to deal with a marauding band of uh, Maori warriors from several tribes that had agglomerated as part of a, an uprising, a rebellion. And in the area of the Taranga Mission, uh, near the Bay of Plenty, uh, he assembled a force of 1,700 men. Now, by world standards and historical standards, you might not think that 1,700 men is a particularly vast force, but by the standards of mid-19th century New Zealand, that was a substantial force. He had a number of uh, naval ships moored in the bay, and they had supplied him with 400 naval troops. He had army troops from four different regiments, and uh, together with a detachment of Royal Artillery, he had, as I say, 1,700 men to deal with this uprising. Um, now, he had 14 artillery pieces going from 6-pounder up to 40-pounder, uh, a very 40-pounder, that's a big hefty gun. He had eight mortars, uh, um, six inches, and f I think two of them were six inches and four, uh, the others were eight inches. So these are big hefty things. So don't think of the, the World War II style thing with a narrow tube, quite portable, like that. No, it wasn't one of those. These are the big hefty siege mortars that lob socking great big bits of ironmongery and explosiveness into the air and down onto the enemy. Um, so these were, yeah, these were the big hefty, like this, this sort of thing, that, that sort of thing. They were like that. And he had eight of them. Uh, and added to this, he got another artillery piece off one of the ships. This was a 110 pounder gun an absolutely colossal thing, and it was, at the time, the biggest gun ever to have been brought to bear against, what shall I call them, uh, the, the less civilised people of the world, natives, if you like. They, they, some people at the time might have used the word savages, but I understand that that's uh, probably not going to please everyone in my audience, but um, you understand that the people who didn't have quite that tech level, um, those sort of people, it was the first time anything that big had been used against them. Uh, so, he uh, presumably was reasonably confident of success. The commander, Sir Duncan Cameron, um, who was a Highlander and quite a respected leader, and so far as I can tell, um, was uh, not blamed for anything that uh, later came to pass. Uh, it seems he'd done everything by the book and had done everything right. Now, uh, I talked about symmetrical and asymmetrical warfare. You see, Asymmetrical warfare, uh, the two sides might have radically different ways of fighting and also radically different chances of success. So you might have one side that is extremely well-trained, well-disciplined, well-equipped, numerous, uh, well-supplied and all the rest of it, and the other side that is none of those things, and you can tell which way uh, that war is going to go. Uh, but this lot, the, the weaker lot, knowing that the war is going to go that way, are probably going to uh, not do the stupid thing, which would be uh, fight a big pitched battle in the open because this side is just going to win. So instead you have, they have to go for guerrilla tactics, hit and run, ambushes, assassinations, some other form of warfare other than the set piece battle, which is what this side uh, is really, really good at. So that would be, be foolish to take them on in the set piece battle. Um, and if you imagine, if you imagine, for instance, setting up a war game, in a war game, usually you want the two sides to have a decent chance of success. In fact, ideally, you might say that both players in the game should have exactly a 50% chance of success if they, are, uh, if they play equally well. Um, so if one side has got uh, a small force of men with smart red uniforms, magnificent moustaches, white pith helmets and Martini Henry rifles, and then the other side, who's playing, say, the Zulus, um, has to have an awful lot of Zulus to make this a fair fight. Because, you know, the Zulus, I mean, fabulous warriors though they were, they just didn't have uh, the, the moustaches. So, with this war, though, against the Maori, it sort of wasn't like that. Because the Maori were also very well disciplined, very experienced, very well trained, often very well led, uh, determined fighters. Uh, with regard to equipment, um, they were less well equipped overall uh, than the British. Um, although they were, and every source seems to agree on this, every source that I've ever read over the years has agreed that they were second to none when it came to siege warfare. They were particularly good with earthworks. They were the, 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 the best sappers in the world, possibly. They could dig trenches quickly and efficiently and they knew exactly where to put them and how to make them and what to use them for. And they adopted an asymmetrical form of warfare against the British. And not actually just against the British, this was a tactic they sometimes used against each other. Um, 
you would fortify an area but rather than hold it at all costs you just held it to uh, make it such that the enemy taking it off you has to pay a very high price. So you fortify this area, you garrison it, the enemy then comes along, takes it off you, but you make absolutely sure he pays a very high price for doing that, you then withdraw and build another fort. They're only made out of earth, you just need a spade and a, few, uh, you know, a, a, a strong back and a determination and you've got another fort and then the enemy has to take that off you, paying again a high price. And this is what they were doing and they created Gate pa. They didn't actually. They created gate pa. I, I always used to think it was called gate pa because I didn't realize that uh, G A T E was actually the English word gate. Um, it was called gate pa after just there was a gate in the area. It, it's extremely mundane. It was called gate pa. Pa is uh, this this type of fortification. Um, it used to be spelt P A H, which I think is a perfectly good way of spelling it. Uh, but a lot of people now are spelling it P A with an accent, a long straight line, suggesting a long A R. But why not just PAH? Anyway, um, they, uh, the Maoris had, the, oh, I said Maoris, you notice there. People used to say Maoris, but generally Maori is now used as the plural. They had constructed a pa on a saddle of land. The, there was a, a road going down to the Taranga Mission and uh, a trench had marked where the mission territory ended and they had deepened that trench and lengthened it so that it went all the way to the swamps either side of, of this raised bit of land. The raised bit of land was about 50 feet high and about 500 yards long and it was next to impossible to get troops around it. So by, by fortifying that point they were, they were challenging the British. Come on then, take us if you can. Uh, the part itself was about 80 yards by 30 yards, which isn't enormous, uh, but it, it was enough to contain their force. How many Maori were there? Well, we don't know. Um, one estimate is as low as 230, uh, but others tend to be higher, uh, 400 perhaps. We just don't know, but it's in that sort of area. So we can say that the Maori were outnumbered something in the region of five to one. Uh, so the British had more troops, they had artillery, the Maori had no artillery, um, and the Maori, it looked like, were in a, a, a fairly hopeless position. It was just a matter of bringing up the guns and pounding them into submission and then storming in with vastly superior numbers. And smart red uniforms, don't forget. Um, so that was the initial setup. Uh, the Maori had dug in and they then waited. Sir, David, uh, Sir Duncan Cameron didn't rush things. He did everything right. He brought his men up. He fortified a camp 1,200 yards away, which was outside the range of uh, any of the guns that the Maori had. And uh, he had a clear bit of open ground between him and the camp. So there was no risk that the Maori might rush out and, and try to attack him. So he, he, he was playing it carefully. And he brought up his artillery. He got all his artillery dug in nicely, all within range of the camp. Um, there was a, a red flag flying on a pole over the camp and so they were able to, to use that to, um, to zero in all their artillery. And they managed to get one gun round the side in an enfilading position, uh, which was useful because uh, the Maori had dug rifle pits uh, dotted all the way down the slopes either side down to the swamp, again to prevent outflanking manoeuvres. Um, I say to prevent, it actually didn't work because um, the British were able to do a reconnaissance and they found that at low tide it was actually possible to sneak through the swamp on one side. So this they did under cover of darkness and uh, just so that uh, they didn't get overheard and so that the Maori had something to be distracted by, uh, other troops fired at night they probably didn't hit anything usefully. Uh, they just fired uh, at the camp and they got uh, the, the Maori to fire back. Uh, it was a, a largely useless exchange of gunfire, but it covered uh, this, this tr the, the, the troops who got round, that was the 68th, they got round the back of the Maori camp, the pa, uh, which meant that they could prevent reinforcements getting to the camp. Uh, they could also uh, trap in any people trying to flee from the camp and they were able to fire at anyone coming out of the camp to get to the stream to get water. So things were looking pretty good for uh, Duncan Cameron. He had a vastly superior force with all the right kit, all deployed in the right way. He'd cut off the enemy's uh, lines of retreat and supply and access to water. Um, and you'd imagine uh, this was going to be a very one-sided fight. Which I'll talk about after mentioning my sponsor. Now, 
the uh, the Great Courses Plus is has been sponsoring me for uh, over a year now. Uh, thank you to them. And just in case you don't know, you probably do, but just in case you don't know, it's a very large website with thousands. Uh, when I started, I was saying seven thousand. They're now up to about eight thousand lecture courses uh, by uh, top-notch university from press, prof professors from around the world, largely from America. It has to be said. Um, and one of these is Professor. Well, he pronounces it Livicus. Uh, but that's definitely not how it's spelled or how he's introduced by the by the, the announcer. But anyway, if he says Livicus, I'm going to call him Professor Livicus. And um, he does a course in uh, great turning points in modern world history. Um, modern, you might think, well, hang on, I'm not interested in the modern stuff. I want the ancient and the medieval because that's why I watch this channel. Well, it's interesting. He starts in 1433, which is not exactly what I would call modern history. I was taught that modern history started with the Congress of uh, Vienna in 1815. You know, uh, the French have just been stuffed. We could all rule a line and start modern life. Uh, that was when I was told that the modern uh, history started, 1815. But no, uh, he starts in 1433 and he's picked quite a lot of quite interesting and not always the usual turning points in history. Some of them are historical events like the fall of Constantinople, um, uh, the, the, the wars between Russia and Japan, the French Revolution uh, and so forth. But others are more conceptual to do with inventions like uh, powered flight or the printing press or Darwin's uh, origin of species. And New Zealand gets a mention because uh, one of his lectures is about uh, the first women of the world to get the democratic vote, of the, of the modern world to get the democratic vote in 1893 was it? Um, anyway, um, so there are the the, the, you know, the first uh, to get the vote, or the, and, and then the rest. It's amazing how long the Swiss had to wait uh, for the same right. But anyway, um, so that's one of the lecture courses. But is the lecturer any good? I, 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 I imagine you want to know. Well, um, what's his scholar's cradle like? Well, I just I just say this that he holds his hands, he holds his hands like this, pretty much all the time. He, he, it's, it's edge of the seat stuff because he looks like he's gonna go for a scholar's cradle at any moment. But I, 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 oh, I tell you, um, you'll, you'll, it, 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 it's, it's fascinating to watch. And I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm not gonna tell you whether he actually goes for the full cradle, but uh, you keep watching. And he does wear an acceptable amount of beige. So that's one of the many courses that you can uh, watch on The Great Courses Plus. And you can do it for free because if you click on the uh, link in the description, or if you really like typing, you can you can type in www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige, and it'll take you to exactly the same place. And then you can get one month's free trial. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, one month free trial for any of the lecture courses. You can, you can watch them uh, for, for a month and see if you like it. Uh, and then if you, if you do, you can subscribe. Um, uh, there's a disclaimer in the description. Some people in some parts of the world have uh, had trouble paying by certain means. Uh, they're working on it. Um, and oh, I'm supposed to say there's a new feature. There's a new feature which is called audio streaming. Oh yes, it's called audio streaming. I don't really know what it is, uh, but I dare say that some of you young folk will know what audio streaming is and it's a new feature. Uh, so you'll be able to tell that this is in some way good. So uh, the great course is plus, free trial, loads of lectures, why not give it a whirl? Now, the set, the, 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 the scene that I've set earlier, if you imagine, uh, is the dawn arriving at six o'clock in the morning, dawn uh, 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 some cockerel will have crowed somewhere. You can add the sound effect. Thank you. And that's when the British started their attack and they opened with a bombardment and they flung something like 30 tonnes of high explosive shells at that fort uh, and created great breaches in it. The, uh, they, they saw extremely brave Maori uh, coming up in, in, into view and under tremendous fire, the, the risk of, of their... Of, ah, the, I'm, not, I'm not going to start again. I know, I know that I just said, I said blah, 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 like that, which suggests that I fumble, but I am going to carry on because I'm not the sort of person who, who wants to start all over again and do take two on this. So, uh, great danger to themselves. They were uh, putting in repairs uh, to their uh, earthworks. And an interesting thing happened. It's a very interesting thing, and it's the sort of thing which is extremely difficult to uh, to simulate in something like a war game. They found, did you remember I said that they zeroed in their artillery on a, a flag that was flying over the camp? Yeah, looking through a telescope or binoculars or whatever they had, they saw this this flag, and they had to, uh, the, the the flagpole, and they could see a man next to the flagpole. So it's a decent estimate of how 
tall the flagpole was, and they could take bearings off it, and they could zero, and they did. They very accurately zeroed in their artillery on that flagpole. Having made the perhaps understandable assumption that it was in the camp, it was actually the other side of the camp. And for two hours, the British artillery very accurately pounded the blazes out of an area of empty land the other side of the camp. Can you imagine that happening in a war game? Um, you, you, you roll the dice to see if, if this, uh, this cannon hits and then that one and that one and that one. You, you spend several turns rolling for all these various things in loads of dice and every single one is a miss? Uh, you, and if you announce to the, the, the player playing the British, oh, oh sorry, there's something I didn't tell you, which means that all your artillery has missed. Um, but anyway, uh, they were just pounding the hell out of the land the other side of the camp. Um, some of their longs were actually causing casualties to the 68th, who were the other side of the camp, and presumably word somehow got back to the artillerymen that they'd zeroed in on a, a, a rather useless thing. Uh, so. This happened, this went on for about two hours. So they spent two hours blasting a load of empty land. But after a while they found the range and uh, the 110 pounder fired a hundred shots uh, when it ran out of ammunition at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so they created breaches in the defences and now it was time to get ready with the storming party. They put together a storming party of 600 men in a column four abreast. Um, it was interesting that most of the column, um, the storming party, were naval personnel. Now, I don't know why that should be, and I should warn you now, what I'm about to say next is pure conjecture, but I do wonder if uh, naval personnel were used for that job because they were actually considered more experienced at it, better at it, because the, the Royal Navy in this period had fought an awful lot of actions landing troops, marines, on coasts to take coastal forts. Um, so they would have had a lot of experience of, of, of taking forts. Uh, plus, storming uh, into a, a, a PA, a, an earthwork fortification, is not so terribly diff different, perhaps, from storming onto another ship in a boarding action. So possibly they were more experienced and more specialist trained for that sort of action. Conjecture. But in the vanguard, in the vanguard were army troops of the 43rd. Um, how significant was that? We don't know, but possibly because of what happened next. So, in they stormed, they rushed up cheering. There was some fire that came out of them. A few men were wounded on the way in, but really very few. Now you can imagine, can't you, as you're charging in four abreast into a fortified position with the enemy in there, that your heart's been going, the heart will be pounding like crazy and you'll be pumped up with adrenaline and you charge in and when you come to the breach you imagine well they're bound to concentrate the fire on the breach itself so getting through the breach would be a, a, a really dicey moment but just hope that when you rush through no one happens to be shooting at that moment and then you're through and then they were into the camp and then not a lot happened they were in the camp and there was a five minute lull at this point and you can imagine that your heart can only pound at that sort of level for, for only so long and you can imagine that your adrenaline levels might start coming down as you look around. And they found a few uh, dead and wounded Maori, but not very many, and uh, it was very difficult to find their way around because the Maori had built three tiers of trenches, each overlooking the, the, the next outward, and these were all in zigzags, and they'd built a lot of overhead cover. So a lot of the trenches were covered in uh, stout, with stout upright posts and then a layer of twigs with earth piled on top with about a six to eight inch firing slit above the trench. And, unbeknownst to the, the British, dug into the side of a lot of these trenches were entrances to bunkers, underground bunkers, where an awful lot of Maori had been sitting for the last several hours. Now, um, I first read of this battle in this uh, rather magnificently bound book. This is one of uh, seven volumes, Battles of the 19th Century Illustrated. Uh, this was published between 1901 and 1910, which means that uh, with a lot of these actions, uh, they're actually uh, being written about by people who were there or who talked to people who were there because uh, it was a quite recent past for them. Now in this book, the authors didn't have the First World War to use as an analogy because they were writing before the First World War had happened. So they didn't 
have, for example, the Somme to say it was a bit like the Somme, where the Germans in deep bunkers were able to survive uh, the huge amount of artillery pounding that preceded the assaults on the first day of the Somme. So this was more of a surprise. It was more of a surprise to them that it was possible to live through such a storm of artillery. So the men were walking around the camp and they saw these little houses and uh, some of them were thinking, well, maybe I'll find some curios or maybe some valuables to loot. And they started walking around, having a look at some of the fallen and, and trying to find their way about, which was not easy because of these zigzag trenches everywhere. Um, in some accounts, the zigzags are suge the suggestion is that they were dug in order to make it confusing for the attacker and for the observer when looking at the fort, uh, how he might find his way around. Although, of course, in World War I, uh, the trenches at the, at the front, they were also in zigzags and various uh, similar patterns, so that if a, a high explosive shell did land directly in a trench, it wouldn't blast all the way along a great long stretch of trench, but the blast would be confined to that little part of the zigzag. So that could also have been. Uh, a reason that they had these zigzags. Anyway, so it was very difficult to find their way around and there, of course there are massive craters everywhere and so they're picking their way over the earth and then suddenly a volley of shots rings out and a load of their officers drop dead. Um, so many of their officers were shot in the first volley that it seems quite certain that the, uh, the Maori had this as a pre-arranged plan. When some signal is given, shoot the nearest officer. And the Maori were familiar enough with British uniforms and so forth that they would have found it pretty easy to recognise which one of these men uh, was an officer. And of course they were at very close quarters and it seems that suddenly there were, there were just blasts coming out of the ground. Now the, uh, the British were uh, using rifled um, muskets at this point. They were firing mini balls. Uh, this were the, uh, they were Enfield, the 1853 pattern Enfield, which was a perfectly uh, serviceable rifle, but it wasn't very fast firing. Uh, it was good in open battle, but here the fact that the uh, Maori had double barreled shotguns was definitely to the advantage of the Maori. Uh, double barreled shotguns are only effective at very short range, they're completely rubbish at sniping, but they are effective at short range and you can reload them an awful lot faster than you can reload uh, a muzzle loading mini ball firing uh, rifled musket. Uh, so actually at this distance, the Maori now had the advantage. They'd managed to get the British to fight them at a range that suited them. And men were then pouring out of holes in the ground. Just suddenly there was a puff of dust and another one and another one, another one with war clubs and spears. And the men panicked. Uh, I think part of the reason that they, the panic, when I say the men, I mean the British, uh, army troops in the vanguard panicked. I think one of the, the, re the reasons they panicked was that they were a little bit scattered by this point. During that lull they'd spread out and they started to calm down thinking, oh well the, the fort's been largely abandoned. Um, so uh, we've, we've pretty much taken it. In fact one officer is reported as having gone back to the, uh, the CO to report that the fort had been abandoned. Uh, uh, and then the fighting in earnest started. Now exactly what happened Nobody knows. Almost every account written uh, at the time and since talks about how nobody knows what happened. Of course loads of people who were in the fight were interviewed but they all had conflicting versions of what happened. It seems that uh, one of the reasons that they panicked was that they thought that reinforcements were coming into the camp. This could be because some of the 68th from the other side of the camp uh, were coming up and they were mistaken for Maori reinforcements. Uh, one version of the tale is that a load of Maori were actually trying to make their way out of the camp but then were repulsed back into the camp by the 68th stationed the other side and that these Maori coming back into the camp were mistaken for reinforcements. Um, but I think actually it's probably the fact that they just weren't expecting what happened and that these, these warriors were popping up from all around them and they themselves had become scattered. They felt safe fighting in the usual way that they, they, they fought with a, a man either side of them and orders and and formations and so forth and now this scattered every man for himself fight threw them into a panic. This was not the way they liked to fight and so they felt completely um, all at sea, out of their out of their out of their comfort zone. Oh what an awful ex modern expression to use but you know you know what they meant don't you? That wasn't the way they were used to fighting. They were used to fighting their way and winning and now it seems that the the, the native enemy were fighting the way that suited the native enemy. Anyway, they did panic. Uh, 
Um, and in the panic, two VCs were won. So there were acts of conspicuous bravery, um, lots of men rescuing uh, the fallen under tremendously heroic circumstances. But there's no hiding the fact that the British panicked and fled. Uh, Captain Hamilton, leading the rescue, uh, came up with the reserves and charged in and unfortunately was immediately shot in the head and killed. And I do wonder, I get the impression reading the accounts that that was the moment where the, the British morale broke. And I, I do wonder if seeing apparent salvation, seeing apparent rescue, seeing a properly ordered, well-led column of men rush in, in a position to, to, to bear and charge the enemy and, and save the day, seeing that hope dashed is actually probably more damaging, well, perhaps more damaging to your morale than not seeing any, any hope of rescue at all. Anyway, the British ended up withdrawing and uh, with their tails between their legs, falling back to their camp. And night fell. And it was a very long and anxious night for the British, uh, during which uh, the Maori shouted all sorts of taunts at them in English to go on, have another go. Um, so the British were able to make good some gains. They, they fortified a line only a hundred yards from the, the Maori Pa. So they, they had gained a lot of ground and they were able to bring guns up into slightly more threatening positions. But it says a lot. It says a lot for just how damaged the British morale was that on the next day, the 28th, they didn't attack, nor on the 29th. It wasn't until the 30th of April uh, that they had another go. And then when they went in, again, boom, charge, that time the camp had been uh, abandoned. The Maori had held the camp and caused casualties, then slipped away through the lines of the 68th at night. The 68th were too, were too widely uh, spread to stop them and uh, had, had got away. Uh, admittedly, seven weeks later, the, the, the force was uh, caught and, and beaten in another battle. But this, this was a very definite defeat for the British. And it was seen as a defeat. In fact, it was the biggest military disaster in New Zealand ever for the British. Um, so it was a bloody nose given by a handful of natives armed largely with clubs and spades against what at the time was supposed to be the best army in the world. Well, I think actually it, it's not unreasonable to say that it was the best army in the world. So it's an example of asymmetrical, symmetrical warfare. The two sides were using very different tactics, but uh, it was sort of actually a fair fight. It could have gone either way. There was some bad luck with the flagpole in, in incidents and so forth, but there was also very good uh, sap sapper work and determined fighting from the Maori who knew their stuff. They were not pushovers. Um, and both sides, uh, I'm happy to be able to report, respected the other. So uh, when the, uh, the British did go back into the camp and they found dead and dying there, they found that no one had been robbed and no one had been mutilated. And they buried their own dead and they also offered to bury the Maori, uh, but actually uh, they also offered the Maori the opportunity to come and bury their own dead, which they did. Uh, and uh, according to what I've read, the, the lower ranking warriors were buried first and then the chieftains on top, the lower warriors acting as a sort of couch for the, um, the more pampered uh, dead chieftains on top. When the British went into the camp, they found some wounded, which is a horrible thought because this was two days and three nights after the fight. So lying there for three nights and two days were some hideously wounded men, almost all of whom died of their wounds, the ones that were in the camp. The British lost something like uh, 112 men. That's not a huge number. Uh, the Maori at the most lost 50. Um, something like uh, 23 uh, bodies were found, uh, no, 20, 20 dead bodies and six wounded Maori were found in the camp. One of them uh, was a, a Maori chieftain who had seven bullet wounds and two broken legs. And he'd been like, he later died of those wounds, uh, but not before talking apparently quite happily to the, uh, the British, asking amongst other things, why was he not evacuated from the camp by the Maori, unlike so many other of, of the, the, the wounded Maori? But anyway, it seems that the artillery barrage had caused very few casualties, maybe as many as 15 uh, to the Maori. They had dug a very effective uh, fort. So if you're interested in 
uh, unusual um, unusual periods for military history. And if you're trying to perhaps uh, construct an interesting war game where it's not the usual two evenly matched sides, but it's an asymmetrical fight, and yet it's fair without one side having to have overwhelming numbers, then maybe you should look at the New Zealand Maori Wars. <laughs> Hey!